Well, welcome and thanks for joining us on this edition of News 2. I'm Sandra Guman Singh. Today, Governor John DeYoung Jr. addressed the people of the Virgin Islands on radio stations throughout the territory. The governor focused on calling the senators to task and noted that now is the time to act. News 2's Shanika Robinson has this story. Today, Governor John DeYoung addressed the people of the Virgin Islands on territorial radio stations and called the senators to the task. Now is the time to act. Now, more than ever, this is the time for each of us, particularly those elected to lead our community and those whose voices are the loudest, to demonstrate a positive attitude, to make constructive contributions, and to take the positive actions that will build a brighter future. During his address, the governor noted that the territory's problems are many, but each of them are solvable. Governor DeYoung also spoke about the sudden closure of Hovensa and the rum revenue's cover-over rate. The sudden closure of the Hovensa refinery wiped out so much of the progress we have been making. In addition to finding a path forward on the refinery, the Senate must complete its work and address the fiscal year 2014 budget gap. The recent decisions by the U.S. Department of the Interior to only advance matching funds for the coming year at a lower cover-over rate versus its past practice has only deepened the hole. Governor DeYoung concluded his address stating that it is time that we do what must be done. It is time for the legislature to ratify the Fourth Amendment to the Hovensa Agreement and get St. Croix's economy moving again. If they have an alternative that will give us the same level of economic boost, then propose it, let's discuss it, and if it promises to do what they say, I'll approve it. Many had an opinion in regards to the governor's address, and one resident in particular was willing to speak out. The address was interesting, to say the least. I really don't like to defend the senators too much because I'm really, you know, they, they're doing a lot of things that upset me as well. But for him to, to blame them for, for the, the rum cover over being reduced, you know, it's just I, I couldn't even understand that. The concerned citizen also mentioned that he felt the most important issue was left out of the governor's address. He failed to, to really touch on the, the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room, which is WAPA. He's talking about we can't, you know, because Hovens is closed, we can't get businesses and businesses this and businesses that can't open because of this and that. The real reason, if you ask any business person, you can't open a business here in the Virgin Islands, especially in St. Croix, is because, you know, electricity is too high. Shaniqua Robinson, News 2. The governor's address was heard on several local radio stations from 8 a.m. and throughout the day. Well, following. Governor DeYoung's radio broadcast, Senate President Sean Michael Malone said Wednesday in a release that Governor John P. DeYoung should stop pointing fingers and get to work renegotiating an improved agreement with Hovenza to facilitate the sale of the refinery. He said rather than go on the air to frighten the public and blame the 30th legislature for all of the territory's fiscal woes, the governor should take steps to send down a wholly legal agreement with Hovenza that protects the interests of the people of the Virgin Islands. He added that he sent a letter outlining very specific suggestions for improving the Hovenza agreement so that senators would be able to ratify it in good conscience and the governor refused to reopen negotiations. Approving such a flawed agreement would be an outright violation of the public trust by the Senate. Meanwhile, Senator Gittins, in a letter dated September 23, 2013, addressed to President Barack Obama asking for his administration's urgent assistance and intervention in the impending fuel shortage crisis facing the Virgin Islands due to Hovenza's continued threat to discontinue fuel supply to the territory at the end of October. The senator in his correspondence also described the matter as a national security threat. I deem this a national security threat because Hovenza's action will directly affect the U.S. government, namely the military armed forces, especially being that this is the home of the hurricane hunters, and U.S. corporations such as the Postal Service, other establishments or persons through their unlawful influencing of sensitive economic policy decisions. In light of the serious crisis looming on the horizon, I requested that the President organize a meeting with the U.S. Departments of Defense, Justice, Interior, Labor, energy and homeland security to form a task force to address these important and significant concerns. When a community's economic stability, homeland security and survivability are threatened, discussions must be fostered to avoid a volatile situation. In other news, developments continue in the drug trafficking case against former 
DPNR enforcement chief Roberto Tapia and the six other defendants in the case. Tapia and five other defendants pleaded not guilty on Monday in district court, but seemed to have a change of mind by Tuesday. News News April Knight is standing by with an update. Thank you, Sandy. DPNR Enforcement Chief Roberto Tapia pleaded guilty on Tuesday in federal court to racketeering by using DPNR as a criminal drug trafficking enterprise. This is according to U.S. Attorney Ronald Sharp. In his guilty plea, Tapia admitted to trafficking cocaine extensively over a long period of time. He also admitted to using his position as Chief of Enforcement at DPNR and the government agency's assets to carry out the racketeering activity. On Monday, a day before the guilty plea in federal court, Tapia had pleaded not guilty in district court, along with five other defendants. The seventh defendant, Eddie Lopez Lopez, and his attorney, Daniel Ceballos, were a no-show. The drug trafficking case against Tapia and the other defendants began in May 2013. On May 17, Tapia was arrested by federal agents at the Red Hook Ferry Dock, at which time he was wearing clothing with official DPNR insignia and carrying his DPNR issued sidearm. He was also found in possession of a bag containing about seven kilograms of cocaine. The following day, Stephen Torres and Eddie Lopez Lopez were also arrested for being co-conspirators. And on May 24th, VI Police Sergeant Angelo Hill was arrested in connection to the case, specifically for supplying Tapia with cocaine. The other defendants in the case are Raymond Brown, Hector Elsenio, and Edwin Monsanto, who are accused of being cocaine brokers and supply along with Tapia and Hill. Tapia faces a maximum penalty of life in prison and up to $250,000 in fines, in addition to for future penalties and restitution. Sentencing is scheduled for January 9th before U.S. District Court Judge Curtis Gomez. We will have more as information becomes available. And that's all for now. Sandy, back to you. Thanks for that, April. Well, major crime detectives on St. Thomas are investigating a fatal shooting that occurred Tuesday evening. The victim, 27-year-old Avery Martin, suffered multiple gunshot wounds to his body and was pronounced dead at the Schneider Regional Medical Center. We were dispatched to a call of shots fired at about 6.40 p.m. in hospital ground. When officers arrived on the scene, they saw the victim lying in the street with several gunshot wounds to his body. The victim was later identified by family members. Emergency medical technicians on the scene said the victim was unresponsive and he was taken to the hospital where he was later pronounced dead. Major crime detectives continue to actively investigate this case. Police are urging anyone who has any information that would help police with this case to call detectives at 714-9834. The VI Police Department is hoping that the courts will grant them an extension for their final compliance deadline at the end of October. The VIPD and the U.S. Justice Department are in the process of negotiating new terms under the consent decree and an action plan since the VIPD says they won't make their deadline. News News Erica Parsons has more. The Virgin Islands Police Department has missed nearly all of its deadlines under its consent decree and the biggest one due will be no different. They say they won't be able to meet the already extended October 31st cutoff. For that reason, the department approached the U.S. government in August to request an extension on the final compliance deadline. The VIPD was supposed to appear at a court-ordered hearing September 18th, but both the Territory and the U.S. Justice Department filed a joint motion on September 10th to stay that hearing, which the court granted until further notice. Both the VIPD and the U.S. Department of Justice are working together to negotiate changes to the consent decree and action plan. They're getting help from the independent monitors to do so. According to court documents, renegotiating the consent decree and action plan means providing reasonable extensions for deadlines that weren't met while making sure those time frames are realistic and achievable. The October 31st deadline was an extension already granted from a June 30 target and a June 28th motion. The hearing on September 18th would have addressed their audit requirements and action plan because of past deficiencies. Now, if both parties agree on revised terms for the consent decree with court approval, they will have to file a joint motion. If not, each party will have to file their own separate proposal outlining what the next steps will be considering the consent decree's approaching deadline at the end of next month. Erica Parsons, News 2.
Both parties have to file their proposed modifications to the consent decree and action plan, either separately or together, by October 3rd. The Democratic-led Senate is trying to shoot down the latest Republican effort to derail President Obama's new health care law, but before the Senate could move forward today, one senator had to wrap up a marathon speech. Tara Mergina has the latest from Capitol Hill. High noon brought an end to a surreal 21-hour show in the Senate. After delivering a rambling all-night speech railing against President Obama's health care law, Obamacare isn't working. And sometimes making random pop culture references. I want to point out just a few words of wisdom from Duck Dynasty. Texas Tea Party Republican Ted Cruz finally surrendered the stage. For lack of a better way of describing this, it has been a big waste of time. This was all about elevating the debate in the public and giving the American people a chance to speak. After Cruz wrapped up his speech, the Senate voted unanimously to begin debate on a Republican bill that cuts off funding for the president's Affordable Care Act, known as Obamacare. Democrats plan to remove that provision from a budget bill sent to the Senate last week. Now, both sides have just days to agree on a new spending plan to avoid a partial government shutdown that looms after October 1st. That's the same day a major part of the president's health care law kicks in. Starting October 1st, Americans will be able to shop for coverage through national and state administered insurance exchanges. Since President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law two and a half years ago, Republicans have voted 42 times to derail it. Keeping our eye on the economy first, class stamps could be going up by three cents. The financially strapped Postal Service is asking an independent commission to approve the emergency rate hike. Without it, the Postal Service says it will quickly run out of cash. It currently costs 46 cents to mail a letter. The Postal Service gets, its, gets nearly half its revenue from stamps, but fewer people are using them as they turn to the Internet for communicating and paying bills. This is the New York Stock Exchange with Scotiabank Stock Market. Watch everything down. The Dow 61, Nasdaq 7, S&P 4. Coming up on News 2, ready for a family-friendly night out event? The Law Enforcement Planning Commission's annual Night Out Against Drugs, Crime and Violence event has continued to build awareness about illegal guns and other activities. And this year, the agency is celebrating its 26th. Public Services Commission approved another increase for the Water and Power Authority's Levelized Energy Adjustment Clause, or LEAC, but this time the hike is what the PSC's consultants proposed. According to a Daily News report, during a PSC meeting Tuesday, WAPA officials sought an increase on the electric rate of 40.44 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's up slightly from the present rate of 40.27 cents per kilowatt hour. The Georgetown consultant group who served the PSE recommended 41.68 cents per kilowatt per hour, which the PSE approved. It means the average residential consumer can expect to pay $5.67 more monthly on average. Georgetown consultants say they revised WAPA's increase because oil prices have gone up since WAPA requested the filing in August. And they thought WAPA's deferred fuel costs of $3.7 million were short. The water rates will stay the same. The Director of Personnel and the GESC Health Insurance Board of Trustees, Kenneth Herman Jr., would like to advise all active government employees who are aged 65 years or older that they will still be receiving their health insurance coverage under Cigna Healthcare. Active government employees aged 65 years or older should disregard the packages that were mailed to them by United Healthcare. The United Healthcare Insurance only applies to government retirees age 65 or older. For more information, you may contact the Division of Personnel on St. Thomas at 714-5000 and on St. Croix at 718-8588. Well, Friday, September 27th, is the final day to submit essays for the First Lady's First Lady Cecile de Young's annual mental health essay contest. Essays should explore the question, how can persons with mental illnesses be better supported in our community? She said all submissions will be judged by a panel of mental health and education professions. 
in professionals in four categories for a total of 100 points. The categories include structure and clarity, content, references, and creativity. Each category is worth 25 points. The essay should be no longer than 750 words. Essays can be submitted by email to the First Lady's website at www.governordeyoung.com. Well, the Law Enforcement Planning Commission's annual Night Out Against Drugs, Crime and Violence event has continued to build awareness about illegal guns and other activities. And this year, the agency is celebrating its 26th. Now, for years, the night out has been hosted in Frenchtown with hundreds gathering for a rally at the Joseph Aubain Ballpark. You can expect service providers, prevention programs, live entertainment, bouncers for the young ones. Now, organizers hope the night out will be able to reach more of the young people and curb some of the escalating violence in the community. Be sure to stick around. Your News to AccuWeather forecast is coming up next.